this Sunday launching a brand new series called Clarity. So um, um, we'll be in it for the next number of weeks. And during this series, what we're going to be doing is diving into parts of the Bible and helping to bring clarity, I believe, to parts that sometimes we don't understand and we're kind of wondering about just a little bit. What's the Bible say about this and why this and so on? So Clarity just says, look, let's, let's, let's put on our... our lenses, you know, our Bible lenses, and really dive in and understand what Jesus is saying. So I'm sure that lots of us have, have asked this question right here. Um, can you help me understand that? Or can you help make that clear to me? Have you ever asked that question? Have you? So um, you, you've said that. I've said that. Look, I don't really quite understand what you're saying. Can you make that clear to me? And perhaps every husband has said to his wife, this, you've asked this question, can you help me understand? Now, if you're married, and, and guys, you haven't asked your, your wife that question, let me help you out, let me make something clear to you. You should. You should say, can you, can you help me understand that? You know, don't go away just shaking your head like that. It's okay, and so we, we should do that. So um, it's, it's just a good thing. It, it, will help, it will help your marriage out a lot, I promise you. Do it, come back next week and tell me how it went for you, all right? Can you help me understand that? So let me help you, let me bring some clarity uh, to you just a bit. Don't, don't do this, okay? Guys, when a woman is mad, just tell her she's overreacting. She'll realize you're right and calm right down. So, uh, for clarity's sake, okay, you ready? Don't do that. Go away. Okay, we'll wipe that away. So don't, don't, don't do that. Um, when we have clarity, then we have understanding that lacks ambiguity. Things are clear to us. And there is a day coming when we will have full and complete understanding. Now, I've said this before, but I want to say it again. Um, if there's anyone who understands here, anyone here who understands fully everything about the Bible, please raise your hand. And online, right? I mean, like, we all are in that space, right? Where we go like, I don't quite understand everything the Bible says, and I'm there too. So we, 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 we don't. Some things are not really understandable to us, but there's so much that is, and, and, and God gives us his word to lead us and guide us in this, in this world. And so we understand that though there are parts that we do not, and, there, and that there is a day coming when we will understand all things, what about those things that God has given to us today to lead us and to guide us, and can we have clarity about those things? The answer is yes. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, he shares this kind of this word, word picture. He says, for now we see a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully uh, known. So Paul is writing during this, in, this imperfect time, but he points to this perfect time when partial reflection of the present would give way to perfect vision. So the day coming when we will understand fully, Paul would see God as God now sees Paul. We don't have that now in every area, but what we can have is perfect trust. Are you with me? So we may not have complete understanding of everything, but we can have perfect trust in a perfect God. Yes, amen? Amen. In, in, in all things. There is a time coming when all things will be, will be made clear. I believe Deuteronomy 29, 29. Now I think of this passage often. Um, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may be, uh, do all the words of the law. There are secret things. There are things known only to the Lord. The secret or hidden things point to the future experience of Israel, whether they are obedient or disobedient, then hidden, but eventually realized by future fulfillment. Though there are things only known to God, and though there are things that we don't quite understand fully, as followers of Jesus, are we left alone in this world? Are we left to kind of just navigate things and kind of figure things out? When you became a follower of Jesus, you know, was, you know, did God just say to you, hey, let's just see how this thing works out for you? 
You know, have at it. No, the answer is absolutely not. The Bible, God's living word, gives, gives to us guidance for every day. And sometimes it involves correction. And that's what I want to talk about today. If I were to ask you, was there ever a time in your life, um, growing up or even now, in your faith walk or in anything else that you did not need correction, what would you say? Like me, you go, no, there's, there's never been that time. It is true in all of our lives that there are things that we need correction in. And so 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says this, right? All scripture, and I love this version, is breathed out by God. And profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, and for, everybody say it, correction. That word correction literally means restoration to an upright position or a right state. And so kind of grab this picture in your mind of, a, of, of parents who are raising young children. And they're perhaps just, you know, in those early stages of learning to walk. And, the, and she or he's walking along and they kind of stumble. So what do you do? You don't just go like, hey, how's that working out for you down there? That's not what we would do. That's not what you did. That's not what I did. That's not what you will do if you're going to be parents. Well, what, what do we do? We pick, them, we pick them up and we set them straight and we help them along the path. That's what correction means. Let's let the Bible guide us then and correct our thinking where we sometimes stumble along the way or we need correction. Let's let it correct us, stand us up, set us on the right pathway. All too often, we approach biblical teaching through the lens of our emotions. And we say this, I don't like that or that doesn't feel good. Have you ever read a part of the Bible and you go like, I don't think I like that. No, I've, I've said to you, like humanly speaking, there are parts of the Bible that I don't like. I'm not always sure I want to live out my life that way. I do as a follower of Jesus, you know, always seeking to walk in obedience. I know that's, that's you too, but, but listen, now I've used this example before, I'll use it again. When the Bible says this is how you resolve conflict, I'm not sure humanly I always want to do that. And so sometimes we go like, we, we look at those biblical teachings and we go like, I don't like that or that doesn't feel good to me. And so we, what do we do? We walk away from it. When we're to embrace God's word as he seeks to lead us and guide us in, in all life. I had a family years and years ago um, say to me like, I don't think we can come to Gateway anymore because I just don't feel good when I leave. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm not so sure, like, that's my fault. <laughs> you know, if Jesus is speaking to you, like, and he's trying to correct something, like, maybe, like, you should open up your heart to that. But anyway, Vodibachum is a guy I follow. He says, just speaking on apologetics, he says, we tend to gauge the rightness and the wrongness of things based on the emotions that we experience when they're presented. So we'll gauge sometimes biblical teaching based on the emotions at that moment, how it makes me feel. Now we're gonna be getting into the first topic of our series on clarity. We're gonna get into an area that sometimes makes us feel maybe a little bit uncomfortable as both the giver and as the receiver. It's a passage that I think you've heard a lot um, today. Um, if, you, if, if you haven't, you, you might be living in a, like a, one of those booths, you know, we, Silence, you know, you don't hear anything. But in time when tolerance seems to be the clarion call or the very loud, uh, clear, hard to ignore call, followers of Jesus are often told, guess what? Yes, yes, yes. Judge not. In a time when tolerance is being called for. Followers of Jesus are often told, but the Bible says you're not supposed to judge. Does it say that? I wanna bring clarity to that. Unbelievers will say that to believers and sometimes 
believers within the church will say that because there's a misunderstanding of what Scripture is actually saying. And what is being stated here is this. You're not to judge me. I'll determine what's right or wrong. Truth is in the what? The eye of the beholder or is determined by each individual. So like, don't, don't judge me. Don't, don't judge me and don't judge my understanding, my feelings or my belief on that. Don't do that. So whether it's about uh, uh, religion or um, human behavior or sexuality, don't judge me or don't judge my actions because I determine what's right or wrong. And what we're doing is we're placing ourselves in the place of God. God has clearly given us his word. And when we say that, we place ourselves in the place of God. And we, we even actually will even maybe even, you know, buy the t-shirt that says like, don't judge. I've, I have said this before. Um, I'll just give it to you. It's kind of like a little sidebar. Those who accuse others of judging sure judge a lot. Think about it. But where, where does this thinking come from? Like, we're, we're not to judge one another. And, and I said, said last gathering, like, if you want to, like, insert or you want to, you know, like, use the word accountable, accountability in there, like, you want to do that and it makes you feel better, that's fine. But I'm using the word judge because that's what the Bible says. Like, where does, this, where does this thinking come from, the idea that judging is wrong? Well, it comes from the Bible, but it comes from a wrong understanding of what Jesus is saying. So I want to bring clarity to that because I believe that when we live this out in the way that Jesus instructs us to, then it brings health to the body of believers. It brings health to the body of Christ. It brings health to the community of faith or the church, however you would frame it. I'll say it again. And it's one of the things I repeat often. If you've been here at Gateway, you're brand, brand new. Gateway is not a perfect church. Never will be. I pray that we're a healthy church. And healthy church says, look, if you stumble, um, somebody will be there to pick you up. Um, if you have difficult, someone will be there to help you along the way. I, if I stumble, somebody will come around me and help me. That's a healthy church. And that's what we want to talk about today. So let's go to Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to be in the first verses there. Matthew chapter 7. And first beginning with verse number one. Here's what Jesus says. Judge not that ye be not judged. And the words of Jesus are interpreted to mean this. You don't have the right to tell me I'm wrong. You've heard it. I've heard it. Look, the Bible says, don't judge me. You don't have the right to tell me I'm wrong. And if you were to look at only those words, just judge not, you might think that's exactly what Jesus is teaching. But is it? J.D. Greer, I think, accurately stated when he said this, judge not is one of the most popular verses in, the, in our culture because it seems to fit with two of our culture's most basic assumptions that religion is private and morality is relative, which means you can't really tell anybody what they believe is wrong, so people use this verse like a deflective weapon. And immediately what we do is say, don't judge me. Don't judge. And maybe you've done that, and maybe I've done that. Maybe we've all done it. Maybe we have put up that shield when someone has come to you. Or we have experienced it when we have gone to somebody else, and the first thing we get is like, don't, don't judge me. It becomes this defensive weapon. But is this truly what Jesus is teaching? Are we not to judge? Are we not to discern? Are we not to hold one another accountable? What makes for a healthy community. Well, let's, let's read on for clarity. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. 
Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. As with the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is describing life within the community of believers and life for a follower of Jesus. What it looks like being part of the body of Christ. In other words, this is how we're to live out life. We are called to a different lifestyle. Some have referred to it as kind of like an upside down life where, where people will pursue this as a follower. We pursue this. Let me just give you just a few things. Number one, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, what does the Bible say? Turn to him. Yeah. It's upside down. If anyone would sue you, take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles. How about this one? Are you ready? <clears throat> Love your enemies. Now, some of you, a name just popped into your head then. You're like, well, I love that person. This is what Jesus is telling us. When you give, don't sound the trumpet as the hypocrites do. And so what is Jesus saying to you and to me? Jesus is speaking to the dangers of a judgmental attitude or having or displaying an overly critical point of view. This is what he's talking about. In just a few verses, Jesus speaks to the goodness of God as he instructs followers who exhibit the same as they interact with one another. Judge not. Lest he be judged, lest, lest you not be judged. Jesus is saying that God will judge people according to the same standards they apply when judging others. Those who judge harshly, for example, will be judged in the same way by God. Followers are being warned against making judgments in a way that are hypocritical and condemning. Judgmental people will continually nitpick and find fault with one another. And Jesus says, that's not the life that you're to live. That's not the life. I'm going to give you just, I'm going to share with you uh, what I believe is the roadmap to judging one, or holding one another accountable um, in just a moment. But I'm going to give you the problem and the process first. Number one, the problem, we've already talked about many people, quote, judge not that you be not judged, and, and then either fail to read on or notice the command of Jesus to judge. Like, you're going to go like, did you not read the rest of the scripture? So as followers of Jesus, we are to seek discernment with the right attitude and call sin, sin. Does having the right attitude call us to sit on the sidelines regarding our faith and ne not be involved? At no, the answer is no. Jesus called sin, sin. Followers of Jesus are often accused of judging or intolerance when we speak out against sin. But doing so is an unloving act. Opposing sin is not wrong. We depend upon the person of the Holy Spirit to lead us. It's how we do it, our attitude. And it can be either loving or, or condemning. I suppose each one of us perhaps have experienced that. Some of you have experienced just the lovingness of someone coming to you and saying, look, can I just talk to you about something? And you can just sense this incredible, you know, love and concern for that person that you're in relationship with. And so you've experienced that in a really good biblical way. Others, you've experienced it this way, like that's been condemning, you're condemning me, you're critical, look at your own, you know, and, go, and you've experienced that as well. And for some, it has unfortunately driven them away from the church or a relationship with Jesus. Remember the story in John chapter 8, um, the woman who is caught in adultery, because I think it's a perfect example. Verse number 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in their midst. They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. First thing that comes to my mind is what do you mean caught in the act of adultery? Like what were you doing there? Can you see what's happening? <laughs> you're like, you're putting her here, but you, we're watching her. Anyway, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman's been caught in an act of all Now in the law, 
Moses commanded us to do what? Stone such a woman. So what do you say? They were trying to trap him, trying to test him. Then Jesus did something. We don't know what he wrote in the sand, but he wrote something in the sand. Some suggest maybe Jesus was just taking a moment to try to kind of reduce the embarrassment of the situation, or maybe he was writing something that was drawing their attention to their own life. No one really knows, but we know the effect of it. We know what happened, don't we? That immediately um, after he wrote, they began to walk away. Oldest first. And then Jesus said this to the woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And then he says, neither do I. I don't condemn you. But he doesn't stop there. Now he says, go and sin no more. It's a beautiful example. She met a man, Jesus, who was interested in saving rather than exploiting her and in forgiving rather than condemning. And in this moment, it's a perfect picture of grace and truth. So what's the the process of judging or holding one another accountable? First of all, it doesn't begin with the other person. It begins with me. Jesus says, if, if, if it happens any other way, then you're a hypocrite. If it doesn't begin with like you, right, get the speck, get the log out of your own eye before you try to do anything else, then you will see clearly, then you'll have clarity. Like, so it begins with me. We see and embrace community. It's why I'm such a believer in discipleship groups and being connected with other believers because I have people in my life who will come to me if I, if I begin to stumble, or I begin to think unclearly about something. I have people in my life who help to bring clarity. I have my guys group I meet with every Thursday morning. They will help me, I promise you that. I have my team, you saw two of them on the stage today. I have people who will speak into my life, people who I will allow to speak into my life in order to help me understand and bring clarity. That's a role. That, the, that, that is to be played out within the community of, of believers. So my question is, do you have that person? Are you, are you part of a relationship, in a relationship with a group of people that you allow to speak into your life in this way? And do you allow Jesus to use you to speak into someone else's life? If I have a log in my own eye and I'm not seeing clearly, I need help and you need help. Proverbs describes a true friend as one who speaks the truth even when it's hard to hear. Proverbs chapter 27, verse six, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. We are called to help one another navigate the world we live in and we're to do so in a way that honors God. It's part of the beautiful thing of being in a community of faith. Jesus in John speaks of right judgment. And I think we can take those words in scripture to help us understand what wrong judgment looks like and how we can stay away from that. Let me say it this way. There is a difference between being judgmental and judging. Being judgmental is that critical attitude that Jesus calls us away from and and judging or helping one another. Let, Let me say this, technically, or biblically, you may be right, but the message is lost in the attitude. Okay? That's what happens. You may be right, but the message is lost in the attitude. So how do we go about it? Well, quickly, I'm going to give you three things. Are you ready? So Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. We're going to see what happens here. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression... You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. We're going to walk through this passage. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens within the community, within the body of Christ, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Attitude. But let each other, each one test his own work, and then 
His reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. So Paul is imagining this hypothetical situation in which one believer unexpectedly learns that another believer is trapped in some sin or wrongful thinking. What is he to do? Frank Gablin writes this, he says, is he, is he to overlook the sin? So are we to over, overlook that in another person's life? Uh, are we to do that? Does, it, does love mean that he is to refuse to face the facts? Or should he expose the sin openly and so gain for himself a reputation for superior holiness? Paul shows that a spirit-led person should not proceed in either of these ways. In presenting the proper course of action, he shows us what to do, who should do it, and how finally it should be done. So this is what Galatians does for us. So I, I'm a, and I'm reading um, in, a, in my devotions, and I said I'm a Bible, I'm a word circular highlighter. And so I'm going to give you three words that you should highlight or you should circle in this passage if you have not yet already done so. The, <clears throat> this is the pathway to being involved in another person's life or as someone comes to us, all right? Number one, you who are what? Spiritual, circle that word spiritual. Those who are led of the spirit and walk in alignment with the commands of Jesus and who are mature in the faith and seeking wisdom. You who are spiritual should what? Restore. Restore is an interesting word. It, it really is. It's interesting because it's used in the secular for the setting of broken bones or mending fishness. So in other words, um, bring something back to wholeness. So you who are spiritual, you're walking in alignment with, with God's word. You're walking in o- obedience to his word, and who Jesus is, should restore or be involved in that process that brings a person back to wholeness and healing. And this is critical because it's not to prove the other person wrong. And sometimes we go into these, we want to prove that person wrong. That's not what this is all about. It's to restore or to bring back to wholeness. And how do we do it? Circle the word, highlight it with gentleness. Gently and with humility, knowing that no one is immune from falling into sin. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We're to walk in obedience to him. We're to be involved in one another's life. We're to help restore, help, help mend the broken. And we do so in a spirit of gentleness. This, it lacks conceit. It's in humility that we do that. That's the attitude that we're to have. Now, does this mean two things? And then we're going to share in communion together. Does this mean that the person that you perhaps help or judge or hold accountable, whatever word you want to do, is always going to be corrected. No, it doesn't. It does mean that you have obediently followed the Lord and the rest is up to him. The rest is up to him. But we're to be involved in one another's lives in this way. Does it mean that when you go out from here today, when you're online, that the first, now here's what, that, hey, find someone that you can judge. Am I saying that? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that as we live in relationship with one another, I do believe there's going to be those times when I need correction. There's these times when you need correction, when you're going to go like, is that really right? And God is going to use you in someone's life, and God's going to use somebody in your life as well. It's about doing life together. Aren't you thankful that Jesus judged our sins and gave his life up? Aren't you thankful that it was on the cross that our sins were dealt with? And he did so without regard to your sin or to mine. Aren't you thankful that he didn't come up and go like, um, like your sin on a scale of one to 10 is a nine. Oh, and you're a two and you're a three, no. 
Aren't you thankful that he died for you and for me regardless of the depth of sin that we had fallen into? And extended to us forgiveness and a relationship with him. I'm so thankful. And that we can join together as a body of Christ. Next week, I'll be talking about what it, what's it mean to be in the body of Christ. And, and some have said, like, well, I, don't, I don't need the body of Christ. I don't need to be involved in a church. I'm going to be talking about that. Really, the question, can I be a Christian and not be in the church? Yeah, more later. But one of the things I love about being connected in the body is being able to gather around the table. And being reminded again that Jesus died for us. Last week when I was online with you, Jen and I, we, we grabbed some water and I think it was a, a cracker that I grabbed out of the pantry. Join with you here, join with you online in giving Jesus thanks. It brought us together as we stopped and considered and remembered the sacrifice of his life. And so as we do that now, as we take the bread, we do so remembering and giving thanks for his broken body that brings wholeness and healing to us in every way, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Let's take the bread together, shall we? <laughs> this cup that represents the shed blood, the forgiveness of sins. He did what we could not do. Let's take it together, shall we? Jesus, we give you thanks. Guys, with joy that we gather around your table today, remembering the sacrifice, remembering the love. Giving you thanks, Father, for the privilege of being in community, in relationship first with you and then with others in the body of Christ. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.